A country's education system and its universities are a platform, fulcrum, and linchpin for changing societies for good. Well, I'm here to meet a man who's on the front lines of this dynamic field of change, an academic, an educator, who's transforming the way we look at education and merging the fields of business and social impact for good. I'm here to meet Dr. Chito Salazar, our thought leader for this week. So listen, I, I want to understand first at the beginning, you know, your father, the late Milton Salazar, one of the founding fathers of AIM. How was that like growing up with him in terms of an influence as a professor and a member of the academe? Well, we kind of came from a very traditional family and my dad was kind of like very traditional in that sense. So it was almost like in our family, it was almost like our direction was we were all going to become businessmen. So when I was growing up and when I, was be, when I would be asked uh, what you want to be when you grow up, it would be I'd be a businessman. And it was going to be a traditional route of Ateneo, two years of work, MBA, then work, come back and work for some business. That's the way it was. That's what the route my dad took. And so it was the route we were all going to take. Well, I mean, that also certainly influenced your path. You took the top program at the Ateneo, a management yes. engineering program. And yet, I mean, you went beyond tradition. There was a lot of student activism at that time, and you decided to dive right into it. Tell us about how you balanced the demands of the management engineering program at this top university, and at the same time, the social calling that you had. At that point in time, both my studies and my social uh, work outside seemed to blend together. And so I was enjoying my days in college. It was a bad time. It was Feb the end of the dictatorship, the beginning of the new, the new administration. And so it was very active. And you couldn't help but get involved in what was going on uh, in the country. And the funny thing is, my studies were easiest when I was busiest on the streets. You valued your time more because you wanted to spend more time on the streets. You kind of worked harder and uh, paid more attention to it. The few hours you had, for your studies. Well, one of the bits of the formative parts of your education was uh, putting up Tugon. What was it like growing a small organization with a very focused uh, vocation on orphans? I think what's important, uh, what's important is that you realize that more than people or organization, is the mission is really what was important. And so there were a lot of people who were dedicated to the mission and the mission was important. So even when the founders left, it continued on, and I'm happy to say that it's still there. It's still one of the bigger organizations today. What was driving you at that time when you were the head of the student council in terms of getting that message to the student body, this social activism? Mm -hmm. Tell us about what was going through your mind and how you were able to channel that through the student body. Okay, I think there were, there were two. I was, I was in the student council at two very important junctions. The first was the EDSA revolution, and I was at that point a junior representative. And then after that was the first year of the core administration. And the big issue back then was the Constitutional uh, Commission. And I think, uh, first, it was, a, it was a tough time, but it's kind of a privilege being able to witness all of that happening. And I think the idea was we saw how students could actually participate in such a national reform. I think the students were there manning the gates of uh, Krame. We ourselves, Ateneo was responsible for guarding Santolan. Uh, and we Many times, right? Yeah, and, and so it, that was the group that was tear gassed. Uh, so so you, you saw how you could channel how an organized group dedicated to a mission and a vision could actually influence major national events, even if they're just students. Well, you know, it happens conversely as well. That exposure, that vocation influenced you because at the end of the day, thinking about a traditional career path, you actually broke away from that and decided to pursue, you know, further studies in graduate education. Yes. Tell us about that journey and your choices you had and how you ended up into another Je Jesuit institution. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, well the, the first thing was what, what really changed was that my being exposed to, 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 the, to the orphans, the, the orphans who were in the government uh, orphanages, my being exposed in student council to the problems, in, uh, problems of labor, the problems of students and schools elsewhere. I think all of this basically made me realize that I wanted to be involved in changing the world. And business for business's sake just didn't seem to make sense. And because I was more involved in the student council, and even when I graduated, I stayed part of the student movement, uh, I realized that the way I wanted to change the world was through education because there are many ways to solve poverty but the way I, that was, I felt closest to my heart was I felt that if we wanted to help the poor rise out of poverty, the best way to do this would be through education. So you're looking at impact already. In yes. Terms. And so, so that's what took me to, to education. And then years later, you realize that you're not equipped. You don't have enough knowledge to make a difference. And so I needed to study some more. 
and I needed to study, I, wa I, I wanted to study abroad to broaden my perspective. And I, the reason I went to a Jesuit institution was because, honestly, uh, it's the only place that I got a scholarship. I couldn't afford to study on my own. Uh, I did apply to some pretty good schools for my master's, and I was, not, I was accepted in all of them. But the financial aid was not Financially, there. I couldn't afford it. And so the, f the funny thing is, it was the only non-education program I applied to. All the other four programs I applied to were all education. In international political economy was still relevant at that time. You oh, yeah. Tell us about how that formed you. I mean, being there in the Bronx, thinking about things, um, trying to carve your own niche and your mindset in the world. Tell us about that. At, at this point, at, at, I think at this point, uh, uh, it was more a, a theoretical knowledge development that I needed. It wasn't, in, it wasn't so much. I understood what's going on in the country. I understood what was... Uh, what the need, what, what the needs were, and I, and and I, I, I believe I, I really wanted to make a difference in the country, but I, I needed the information, the the credibility, the the knowledge to do this. And, uh, I think that's one of the biggest learnings, and how it all intertwines. I'm a, one of those believers, one of those persons who believes that you cannot separate politics from economics. So that's why it's political economy. So you have to be able to find that that junction of being able to work for people but being able to create policies that affect as many as possible. Well, you got that nexus certainly there at yes. Fordham, and, and you took that further at American University you know, with your international relations PhD. Tell us about what your field of study was, why you chose that, and how you thought that could apply back home. Okay, the, in my PhD was a little bit similar. <laughs> I was actually applying for PhDs in economics, but sure. I, again, in this case, I couldn't find something that would, would get funded. But the good thing was, when I was in American University, what I specialized in was development management. So then I was exposed to all of these different models. Uh, this was the height of BRAC, the height of Grameen, this was the height of the Latin American uh, uh, the spring when they were all coming out of dictatorships and all trying to think of development models, we would be able to look at the world development model. So, I'm sorry, the world bank model. So this was, uh, this was a time when I was actually able to look at different ways being applied all over the world to help people out of poverty. And, uh, and so it was, I learned so much and I think it was, so my two fields were development management and international development. So one gave me, one gave me a look at the grassroots from, from agricultural development uh, to rural development and the other gave me a policy perspective, what the World Bank was doing, what the IMF was doing, what the IFC was doing. So it's a great mix and uh, it really provided the context I needed. What is your mindset in terms of how do I put this all together to go back home to the Philippines and think about, okay, what is the proper hybrid here for a country like the Philippines, which is going through its, all this tumult as well? Well, I think, I think that, that's, 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 a, that's a good way to put it. It needs to be a hybrid. It has to be born out of the experiences of the people on the ground. You cannot do policy without understanding what's happening on the ground, what's, what's really going on in people's lives, in people's schools, in their homes, at their jobs. But neither can you stay there at that level because many of the problems are national, policy, institutional in nature. So you have to be able to find that, that junction of being able to work for people but being able to create policies that affect as many as possible. And so it's, it's, it's precisely that hybrid which is important. Well, listen, I mean, this was a very productive time for you, and then some. You actually were raising a family at that time. Tell us about the balance. Well, uh, it was tough. <laughs> it was <laughs> tough. I had to, I had to, uh, I was doing more than 40 hours of, sure. besides my studies, I had to, at one point in time, I was working more than 40 hours a week to support my family. Uh, I was, and I was doing odd jobs. I was, I was a, I was a billings clerk. Then doing some research work on the side. Uh, it was tough, but I think the, the good thing was at least for, for a starting family. You know, we started in the States. So we started without the trappings of, 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 of family life here. We didn't have house help. We didn't have people to take care you of You had to do kids. errands all yourself. We had to do errands. I, I, I can boast of the fact that I changed the diapers okay. of my kids. I was in the, in the room when both my daughters were born. So those experiences, I don't think I would have ever gone through. It's tough, and I think it helps you. It helps prepare you for the future. Meaning, after we went through that period, I, I came. I came home with debt. We really had to watch our budget regularly. You know, uh, we wouldn't be able to enjoy. We didn't travel a lot. It's a great crucible for learning. And then the disruption happens. You come back home. How you ended up full circle back to AIM? I was writing my dissertation. I could not afford anymore because at that point your fellowship runs out. I couldn't afford to support a family and myself in the U.S. while writing this dissertation. So I had no choice but to come home. 
And uh, AIM then was an opportunity because my family roots were connected to AIM, so I was able to enter the door in AIM. And uh, that, that's how I ended, ended up back there. It was a great environment because I was in an academic environment uh, that allowed me to write my dissertation and finish my dissertation. I think that's, that's actually not, that doesn't happen often, that you can actually work and finish your dissertation at the same time. So it gave me that privilege. Well, you had that wonderful work ethic, the transition back home, but also the fact that AIM Policy Center was at the front lines and had a platform for looking at those structural reforms at that yes. time under the Ramos administration, where we had these unprecedented raft of reforms. Yes. Tell us about what kind of a role you carved out for the center in terms of being the honest broker or think tank for really a lot of these administration's reforms. Yes, because we, at that point in time, there was no uh, high visible, highly visible academic think tank at that point. The most visible think tank at that point in time was Makati Business Club, which tends to be identified with, with the, the private sector business, business community. Yeah. And so we were able to provide that honest broker picture. And I think our, our main contribution at that point in time was to bring into the discussion uh, the discourse was the co word competitiveness. I think we were the ones who really introduced competitiveness and the importance of seeing the country in light of how it's doing versus uh, its, its com uh, other competing nations. And so we brought that into, into, the, into the discourse. Well, you know, one of the things that you had also going for you is from AIM Policy Center, you, had in you were in touch with many of the advocates and all these movers and shakers. One of them, Gus Lagban. Tell us about that relationship and how that led you to join him in STI. Yeah, uh, the other thing, what AIM did for me was it helped expand my world and develop a network. I mean, at that point in time, on, our on the board of the Policy Center were both Ramon and Jaime Augusto and a few other uh, top, business, all the top yeah. business people. And then all of the different advocacies allowed, us to, allowed me to be exposed to the different sectors. One of them was IT. At that point in time, big thrust of FVR was IT. Big thrust was how do we bring down the barriers to allow IT equipment to come in. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny when you think back Back then, that was a big issue, right? You could not bring in computers without paying taxes. So we were trying to bring down uh, the, the tariffs. And at that point in time, I met Gus. So <laughs> uh, Gus was very active, and we were trying to find ways to improve the telecom uh, sector. And uh, I guess, I guess uh, because of that interaction, uh, when eventually they were looking for people for SCI, he basically just invited me to join. Well, you candidly mentioned those three years as a failure. You consider that a failure in, in a learning experience. Tell us why that was and how that formed you in return. Okay, SDI was my first major organization uh, that I managed. It was, it was, it's a big organization. It had about, it had about almost a hundred schools all over, all over the country and you had to deal with different personalities from people in the uh, people like Mr. Yossi Tanko and uh, Gus Lagman, all the way to people who were <laughs> franchises in Surigao. And uh, trying to deal with that for the first time uh, was not easy. And I guess being my first stint at that big organization, I totally, I totally stunk. <laughs> I was terrible, I think. Uh, well, you're at least candidate to admit it. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> uh, I, and I can imagine when I look back and think of all the people who, who I worked with, how much pain I must have cost yeah. them. Because <laughs> I really was, you know, and, and, and because I was a young CEO and you feel like, hey, you know, you're a little bit on top of the world. You're, I wasn't even 40 and you're a CEO of a top corporation and we, were, we moved off this to Ayala where, where they are today. So you really feel like you're on top of the world. It kind of gets to you when you're, when you're, when you're that young and that, that early. And so I, I must admit there was some ego involved and I just didn't make the right decisions. I was, I think I was being guided more by ego, pride, image, then, then some very, very basic business uh, and business principles. And the organization's a little bit political, uh, which, which is something I also was not ready for and could not handle. And so it was, and I think at, at the, the politics, the, the ego, uh, everything combined, I just failed. I think I was a total flop. We believe that we wanted to help people change their lives through education. And the way to do that is make sure we provide a quality education. So that's what we stayed focused on. It could not be just a diploma. It could not just be a piece of paper. It had to be, be a real education that would provide them real jobs. You know, you use that to really form yourself again and just restart and do a reset. And then the serendipitous opportunity with FINMA Education. Tell us about how that transition happened and what did you learn from those previous years that you are trying to improve on and transform within this current setup? Okay, uh, well, 
falling into film education was was ser was really serendipitous. <laughs> and although every you re you realize that you really you really build on all the past. The reason why they were open to considering me for FINMA was Ramon was on the board of Policy Center, and he was happy with the work we did in Policy Center. So he had seen that track record already it, yes. and experience. And so when that door opened, uh, when that door opened, and uh, when, when FINMA invited me in, FINMA was still not sure how they wanted to get into education. So they basically asked, could you write us a strategy? And one of the things, the interesting thing they asked me was, should we follow the STI model of many, many smaller schools all over? And actually, because of my learnings, I said no. That's not the way to go. And so I wrote them a, a, a strategy which focused on buying bigger schools rather than setting up a whole bunch of small schools. And uh, they liked it, so they took me in. Now, I my probably most important thing I learned from SDI, which I applied in, in, in FINMA education, is one must always be guided by the mission. And let that, that must be the paramount the paramount deciding factor. But one of the things also with a big conglomerate is how do you apply a business model, a changing business model, to something that has a social impact like education. Tell us about how you're able to change mindsets or at mm -hmm. least align the mindsets towards this type of endeavor. Well, first the good thing is because of this whole, this whole, this whole field of CSR, there you hear more people saying that the objective or the goal of business should not be profit. It should either be to provide employment, provide a service, provide a good product. In, in our case, it was a big struggle in the beginning because uh, when we were still struggling with the model, our numbers were not doing well. Our enrollment was dropping, uh, et cetera. But I think what was important was, again, uh, we believe that we wanted to help, people's, help, people, uh, help people change their lives through education. And the way to do that was make sure we provide a quality education. So that's what we stayed focused on. We stayed focused, and even when the numbers were not doing well, we just stayed focused on that. And so when the results, when our academic results started to improve, the numbers just started to follow. But it took a few years. It took maybe, my guess is about seven mm -hmm. years of trying to stay the course. And it was, I, I, must, I must give a lot of thanks to my board because despite the fact that we, the numbers were dropping. Yeah, and I would imagine their metrics were very different in the initially for the, all the other businesses, whether it be energy, yes. cement, or whatnot, right? But tell us also about what the inflection point was. Within those seven years, when did you feel that this model that you were pursuing was proving itself? Uh, actually, I didn't start to feel it until maybe the fifth or sixth year, wh when our academic results started to show. You know, it's, 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 it is, the, the how important, how paramount the mission is, really, really comes to you when you see, when you really work with the students, when you really realize how difficult their lives are, and how important it is for them to get a good education, and to really improve their lives. Now, it has to be a good education. It could not be just a diploma. It could not just be a piece of paper. It had to be, be a real education that would provide them real jobs. It's also a good model for other conglomerates who are thinking about it. I mean, you know, you are on four or five of the major conglomerates are now getting into education, but you seem to have found the right formula in terms of getting quality up first and then having the financial metrics follow. Is it something that you think is going to be a major field for FINMA in terms of, uh, in terms of business returns and at the same time focus? To be fair to the other conglomerates, I have much respect for them. They believe the same thing. That's why many of the, what happened was the whole sector kind of like disrupted with STIs and AMAs, yeah. who came in, brought a lot of marketing, which sure. none of the big guys knew how to do. And so it kind of changed the ball game. But then when the big guys started to refocus, uh, and they focused more on quality, I think their, their numbers started to all pick up too. What makes us a bit different was our market. We were, were I, th I believe until today, we're still the only group that intentionally targets the lower income market. That is really trying to, as a matter of fact, drive down our expenses so I can lower tuition fees even more to get a bigger portion of the low income market to come to us. Uh, so in that sense, we're different. I, I don't want to give, I, all the other guys also knew you had to hit sure. quality first. But, but in our case, trying to create a quality product for the, for the lower income segments is a little is Yeah, with tricky. limited wiggle room as well. Right? Yes. It's a little, little wiggle room because our tuition fees are what, 12, 12 to 14,000 a, a semester. Uh, and yet you, we pay our faculty really well. Uh, we give bonuses like other corporations. But, and, and, and we're getting kids with really, really weak backgrounds. That's, that was, the, I think, the, the secret sauce, so to speak. How we, make, we made all of that, all of that work. And, uh, and, and, and so I think in education, just like almost any other business, quality of the product must come first. 
Uh, but in our case, what made it different was it was a quality of a product being offered to a heretofore not served market. And certainly a relatively higher risk in this segment, but at the same time, the bottom of the pyramid happens to be where the upside is. So tell us about what your views are now merging and fusing the policy side of your background with the education business side that you are in now. What does it take to have industry and academe come together to be able to produce the kind of workforce that really will make a difference in terms of leadership of the country? Oh, tough, tough. Uh, it's almost like getting, you know, whenever I, because I'm at that intersection, and I always say when you bring the two groups together, it's like they talk different languages. They just talk differently. It's almost like you need to translate. I think when you look at models around the world where this has worked, you really need people at the intersection to translate. Uh, to make it, because business always thinks in terms of hard output, well, academia doesn't think in terms of hard output. And, and so you really need to, but you really need to find somebody in the middle to bring together. Normally, it should be government. It doesn't need to be government. I think PBED is playing a big role in trying to make that happen. But uh, it's not going to happen on its own. On both sides, I've heard both sides indicate a strong willingness to come together, uh, to talk, and a, a great openness. But you don't see it happening to the extent that we want it to happen and to the degree we, we, where, where it should happen. So it'll take a lot of effort, but at least the intention and the hearts of both sides are there, which is a long way. And at least now they're on the table talking. But trying to make that, trying to let that move towards results in terms of actual programs will take some time. Well, listen, Chita, you're at the height of your leadership journey, but also at the most interse intersection inflection point for Philippine education and business. I wish you all the best. I appreciate your insights, and great to see you again. Thanks, Kintin. All right, thank <laughs> Take care. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Dr. Jose Rizal once wrote that before nationhood, the Philippines must have an educated citizenry. A hundred years hence, Dr. Chita Salazar at this time has made it his personal mission and vocation to carry forward that legacy more importantly, use the tools of the private sector with a leading conglomerate to transform society for good. Join me again next week as I map the minds and the moves of the country's and world's most successful and influential people.